Hello. In this episode, we're going to look at growth diagnostics as it's supposed to be, at least, put into place in practice. And so it's going to require very careful research, um, extended research, usually by a team, in order to determine what is the most likely binding constraint in an economy. And of course, to think about what policy might best address it, at least in principle. And so this is something that requires what I call economic detective work. It's not a simple matter of form or of following a very straightforward um, formula, but there are some basic principles that you can follow in order to do your detective work, as it were, right? So um, you have to look, in this case, for the implications of being in one of these 10 possible boxes. And so that, for example, we just talked about um, in the previous episode, a possibility that the problem is excessive taxation. So that if that's your hypothesis, then there should be some implications that you see. And so you can expect high movement into the informal sector or the so-called underground economy where it may be more possible to evade taxes. It's costly, of course, to move out of the informal economy, the formal economy and go into the underground economy, but it may be worth these firms while if taxes are high enough. So maybe the constraint is infrastructure. And that was another of the final boxes that we looked at. If this is the case, you ought to be able to say, well, look at the congestion. There's you know, lots of backups on highways, um, lots of bottlenecks. And so it's just taking far too long, too much time you know, to get from point A to point B. If you don't see that, it becomes difficult to make the case that infrastructure is your binding constraint. Um, if the constraint is human capital, specifically in education, then you can expect high rates of return to education. So if you want your hypothesis to be that the constraint facing the country is there's too little access to high school, too little opportunities and support for children to complete their high school diploma before they go to work. If that's your hypothesis, then you ought to see that there's a significant wage premium for people who have that high school degree. If you don't see a significant um, premium, perhaps in relation to international norms or by some measure, it then becomes difficult to say that education, at least in that sense, is your binding constraint at this point. Right? So that as a general rule, the um, analyst, the growth diagnostician, if you want to um, put it that way, is supposed to look for economic behavior that is consistent with agents, firms, or households. But here we're largely looking at potential investors, such as entrepreneurs and firms, you know, these agents trying to get around a constraint. So we look for economic behavior consistent with agents, firms, trying to get around the proposed constraints. And so this is the kind of detective work that one needs to do. And here we can think about the principles of a differential diagnosis that was developed actually by Ricardo Hausmann and some um, colleagues. So um, if a constraint is binding, then first the shadow price of the constraint should be high. There should, for example, be a very high underlying value to building another road or building additional lanes on the road. So movements in the constraint should produce significant movements in the um, objective function that by um, making more high school seats available or making additional lanes in the road available, this should lead to if the objective function here of higher levels of investment and growth. It should lead, it should lead to um, um, noticeably substantial increases in investment. Agents in the economy should be attempting to overcome or bypass the constraint somehow. Um, and so one example that we just looked at was moving from the formal economy to the underground economy. Um, if infrastructure is bad everywhere, there might be some, uh, you know, as long as you can get internet service, there 
maybe some incentive to move into virtual economic activity. So it just occurs to me, of course, as we're now in a virtual mode here. Um, and agents that are less intensive in that constraint, that is to say, use less of that as an input, should be more likely to survive and thrive and, and vice uh, versa. So that maybe the problem has to do with government um, failure, some corrupt area in which you, know, you need to have some contacts with officials to be able to get the kinds of permits and licenses that you need or even avoid being um, um, arrested, right? And so here, you know, if you think that this kind of, of corruption with cronyism is important, you should find those who have very strong ties to government being the ones who are thriving more. That's just one possible um, example here. Um, and so that, um, you know, if you have, um, um, you know, more, so if you have less use of, of finance, for example, and you have um, a tendency in your industry to more often invest out of retained earnings, then you would expect to see a set of industries where in international standards, those are you know, the industries that tend to self-finance. You see those in larger preponderance than those that rely often on external finance. And so you can think of some other areas um, like this as well, the um, um, industries that employ um, people with certain kinds of skills and so on. And so the next thing to do is to look at a specific example and this will be a growth diagnostics exercise that was done for Bangladesh, which was important also because beyond just looking at what would raise the overall rate of growth, they tried to you know, add and enrich their analysis to focus on inclusive growth. So that would be the next episode.